So this is an overview of the coagulation, complement, and kinin pathways. The image may look really complicated at first glance, but let's go through this in pieces and then bring everything together at the end. Now the left side here summarizes the extrinsic and intrinsic coagulation pathways. Let's start here. These are both pathways to help initiate coagulation. Little a stands for activated. The extrinsic pathway starts with factor 7 to activate factor 10 to 10a. The intrinsic pathway starts with factor 12. When factor 12 is exposed to a variety of substances, such as collagen, the basement membrane, activated platelets, or HMWK, which stands for high molecular weight kininogen, it's transformed into 12A. 12A then converts 11 into 11A, which converts 9 into 9A. Factor 9A then uses factor 8A as a cofactor to turn 10 into 10A. Factor 10 begins the common pathway. Activated 10A uses factor 5A as a cofactor to convert factor 2, or prothrombin, into factor 2A, or thrombin. Once thrombin is activated, it begins to break down fibrinogen into fibrin monomers, which will aggregate in the presence of calcium into clots. Thrombin also converts factor 5 to 5A and factor 8 to 8A, providing positive feedback to amplify the coagulation process. Factor 13A is activated by thrombin as well which further helps to stabilize the fibrin meshwork. Everything that we've discussed so far regarding the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways is related to creating a blood clot. However, once the clot is created, how is the body going to break it down? The breakdown pathway starts with pro which is activated by factor 12A to form calicrayon. Calicrayon functions to enhance inflammation and also initiate clot breakdown. The former starts where calicrayon converts high molecular weight kininogen into bradykinin which begins a kinin cascade that increases vasodilation, vessel permeability, and pain, all of which should be familiar signs of inflammation. Think back to Ruber, Kaler, Dolor, and Tumor. The second function of calicrayon is to help break down and modify clots by starting a cascade that eventually activates plasminogen into plasmin. Plasmin functions to break down the fibrin mesh into fibrin degradation products. Even if clot formation is desirable at a particular location, it's important to have some functioning plasmin around to ensure that the clot growth doesn't continue indefinitely. Plasmin also helps to activate C3 to C3A, which then begins the complement cascade and a number of pro-inflammatory effects. There are some serious clinical consequences of having a deficiency in any of these factors, and this is a high-yield topic for the boards. Two common deficiencies are factor 8 in hemophilia A and factor 9 in hemophilia B. Another important point is that factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are produced by the liver in an inactive form and then activated in a vitamin K-dependent process. Vitamin K is also used in the synthesis of protein C and protein S. The way you might see this on the boards is that deficiencies in vitamin K or pharmacologic inactivation of vitamin K leads to a decrease in the factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. This promotes increased bleeding. On the other hand, if a patient has a bleeding problem that does not correct with administration of intramuscular vitamin K, think of liver failure. Warfarin is a drug that works as an anticoagulant by inhibiting vitamin K activation. In addition to plasmin, another important mediator of anticoagulation is antithrombin, which directly inhibits thrombin and factors 7A, 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. Heparin is a drug that activates antithrombin and therefore has anticoagulative effects.